What do we know about the Liverpool attack? Well, clearly it's an emerging situation and the Home Secretary is being kept briefed on it. You will have seen it's been reported that uh, three people have uh, been arrested under counter-terrorism offence. It's clear it's an ongoing investigation, so there's a, a limit to what I can say on it. But uh, as the Prime Minister said last night, and I very much share his uh, deep sympathy for the person that's lost their life and the um, injuries that have been sustained in this extraordinary um, an appalling attack to, to do so uh, at, at a hospital and it's a reminder to us all that the the threat of terrorism hasn't gone away and how much we depend on our police and security services. As you say it's a developing situation but um, there is a lot of um, speculation in fact there's a photograph of a, a cabbie who um, apparently locked someone into a vehicle and managed to get away, uh, but he has been um, injured. He's now seriously ill in hospital. I mean, if that's the case, such bravery um, that potentially saves so many lives. Well, isn't that the case, the contrast between the, the cowardice of uh, terrorist attacks and the bravery of ordinary Britons up and down the country who, who put other people's lives uh, before their, their own. Clearly, we'll have to see exactly what happened there. But if that, that is the case, that's another example of, of, of true bravery and courage. Absolutely. Any plans at this stage to raise the alert level? Uh, well, that, that is a matter for the, the Home Secretary and uh, the, the Joint Intelligence Committee based on uh, evidence. Uh, I think that this sort of attack is consistent with the uh, existing uh, terror level, but clearly that is kept under review by the government. OK. Um, and, of course, we'll hear more about it throughout the course of the day. What we do know is that there were, uh, moving on to COVID, 448,000 boosters given uh, yesterday. It's really ratcheting up now. Um, when will the jab be rolled out for, um, as one of my colleagues said, the younger age group, in other words, the over 50s? <laughs> well, the, the, I, know, I, I think the, the, we're, we're progressing through the um, through the over fifties, and as you say, we actually made, made very good progress. I think we're now at a twelve million, two million jabs in the past week. Uh, there will be a further announcement uh, from JCVI, that's the independent uh, committee, later today on the rollout of uh, booster jabs. Clear, it's up to them, but I would hope that we would see a further expansion of, of booster rollouts. Uh, but we'll wait for their announcement. So that's today. the JCVI. They're the people that advise the government and they're going to make a further announcement this morning. Yes, yeah, so, so we're expecting a further announcement from them uh, outlining what, what the next steps are. Clearly, they're independent of government, but... Uh, yeah, we, uh, we would hope that, the government, that they will be advising us for, with further progress yeah, on that. Yeah, OK. This, I mean, there is less than six... I was, we were looking this morning, less than six weeks to Christmas. Can you believe it? Um, what are your predictions for any restrictions leading up to Christmas? Well, really, Kay, it's in our hands. So all of us, all of your viewers, um, if you get the booster when the call comes, that is the biggest wall of defence that we have against COVID. And if you look at some of the numbers... Uh, at the end of October, infection numbers were roughly comparable to where they were mid-January last year. If you remember, that was really at the height of it last year. But hospitalisations were 74% lower. Now, that shows you the power of the vaccine. So I'm confident that if we stick the course, if people take the, the boosters uh, when they're asked to do so, that vaccine wall will hold up and we'll be able to have a, a decent Christmas this year. Mm. I mean, we're looking at countries like Austria just across the channel and they are saying, if you've not had your vaccine and your booster, you have to stay at home. We're locking you in. Other people who are fully vaccinated can go about their business. Is that something that we might look at? Uh, that's not something we're, we're currently contemplating. Of course, it is the case, although it's, it's an entirely separate matter that in relation to very high-risk areas such as care homes, we are requiring people to have those those double jabs. It's always been the British tradition, I think, to, to move on a consensual, voluntary basis. So we, ha we have no plans to, to uh, have that kind of differentiated approach between the vaccine and the non-vaccine. But it is so essential because it's if you take the further vaccine, it's good for you, so it protects your own health, but it also protects everyone else's health because there's a lower risk of catching the disease and therefore transmitting it. Yeah, although it's not consensual if you work for the NHS, is it? Because you're changing the rules there. Uh, well, well, yes, but that, that is in a specific um, situation where you're an employee and you're dealing with very, very high-risk people. Mm. I wonder if I could just go back to Chris, uh, Christmas just for a second, because mm. I know that we, you know, we, we were in a similar position this time last year when we were saying Christmas, you can have Christmas with your family, etc. And then two days before, the rules were mm. changed. You just said that um, it's in our hands. Mm. So we we really do need to make sure that we have these boosters when we're called or potentially we could find ourselves in a challenging position again? Well, the way we avoid a challenging position is to, to take the booster. I can assure you there are 
no plans or anything else to, to, to stop Christmas happening, but the way you can guarantee... To be fair, he did say that this you, time but last the, year. But no, but the huge difference this time, Kay, is the vaccine and the huge impact of the vaccine. And the way we keep that vaccine topped up, the way that we keep that, that wall of defence protected is get your booster when you get the, the call-up. Because if you compare to where we were last year, zero people had the vaccine. We're now at around uh, 89, 90% of people, adults, with, with, with the vaccine. So that is what is protecting us from going back to what we had at Christmas. But we have to keep that protection topped up by taking the booster. Do we need to be aware of what's happening on the other side of the channel, though? And, and potentially we could see travel restrictions, given just how high the numbers are. Although in Germany, they're working from home and their numbers are lo lower than ours. Well, what's happening across the channel is a constant reminder that this global pandemic hasn't gone away. Mm. This country's approach to the, the pandemic is to make sure that we have high levels of vaccine protection. So that's, that's why we keep pushing the message on the, the vaccine. So I think that that is the most appropriate uh, approach for this country. Although we have had heard criticism previously for the government not protecting our borders, not closing down quickly enough. And as a result, we find ourselves in a position where we've had to lock down. Well, yes, well, of course, we keep keep these things under review all the time. You've seen that uh, we have moved away from some of those restrictions. We haven't ruled it out. And, of course, if the situation changes dramatically, we would have to, to review that again. But but as, as I say, and I forgive me for keep coming back to the point, but really the big thing we're doing in this country is to have the vaccine programme. That is what is protecting us from all those risks that toppled us off course this time last what year. What would change dramatically look like? Uh, well, well, we see if we have, um, for example, a new variant uh, emerging, we would have to uh, consider what our borders would look like in that situation to, to, to protect us as we have done in the past. But uh, I'm confident, and if you listen to people like the chief medical officer, if you listen to the chief scientific advisor, they are confident in the government's approach of putting uh, our faith in the vaccine programme. And so far, that has worked. If you remember back in uh, the 19th of July, all that debate about should we open, should we close, mm. uh, for example, Kirsten was saying, let's not have this, this final phase of reopening. We were only able to do that because of the vaccine programme. We said we had confidence in it, and actually that proved to be the right call. Um, AstraZeneca is um, saying that they're going to start earning a modest profit from their vaccine, uh, previously sold at cost. What's the government's view on that? Well, I think uh, drug companies like AstraZeneca, who've invested huge amounts of, of money into the vaccine programme, are entitled to have a profit from their investment. Actually, if you look at the Oxford AstraZeneca model and contrast it to others around the world, the number of uh, very, very low cost doses that are made available to particularly to developing countries is, is an exemplary model. Mm -hmm. But is it right that they charge, um, they're, they're about to start making a profit? Well, I, I think it's, it's up to AstraZeneca as a commercial company to be able to make a, a modest profit on what was a huge investment. But I think it's also worth noting that the model that they have has allowed lots of low-cost vaccines to be distributed globally enough, in developing though, countries. Not enough. I well, actually, I mean... I, South Africa and the like. Um, I, I can't recall the, the, ha the, the figures off the top of my head, but I think we're at now tens of millions of vaccines that have been made available from the UK to developing countries. It's always been part of the government's approach, not just to protect people here, but also to get vaccines to developing countries. Can we ask about Belarus and Poland just quickly, if I may? I know it's not necessarily your area of expertise, but you're here representing the government this morning. Are you worried that Belarus could escalate into something really quite serious with um, British troops quite nearby? Well, British troops are in uh, Eastern Europe. For example, we have uh, large numbers of them uh, in Estonia uh, to offer our, our guarantee and protection as part of uh, NATO to, um, to protect NATO countries uh, in, in Eastern Europe. The UK invests more in defence than pretty much any, in fact, more than any other European country as a proportion of our GDP. We stand ready to protect our partners and to uphold peace and security in Europe. Yeah, but how worried are we about what's happening on the border with Poland? Well, it's, um, it's a worrying situation, but uh, I think it's, uh, as I understand, as you say, it's not directly my brief, but the situation is currently under uh, control. But there's, there's uh, a great deal of attention being paid to it by, by the government. We keep the, the whole situation uh, under review. But as I say, our contribution as, as the United Kingdom is to the, the defence and, and stability of Europe. That has continued 
uh, despite us leaving the European Union, it's more important than ever that we, we protect Europe. And we have got troops there to help do that. Yeah, so we're not, we're not un unduly concerned at the moment, despite the fact that there are um, thousands and thousands and thousands of desperate people clamouring to try and get over that border. Well, yes, it's Both a, sides are saying you're not yeah, going it's, it's a very um, It's a very worrying situation, as, as, as I said, and that's why the government keeps it under very close review and it's very much at the top of the agenda for the, the Prime Minister and the, the Defence Secretary. And um, our, our, our military assets are, are, are available there. But uh, as, as I said, at the moment, uh, you know, it's a worrying situation, but we are we're keeping it under okay. review. OK, something else that you're keeping under review is what's happening with SLEAS. I mean, that really got away from you guys, didn't it? Well, the, the, the Prime Minister um, said yesterday, and, and we've said, uh, yes, we, we made some mistakes. We, we would have done things differently, and, and, and we've said we regret that. Now, he hasn't said he's sorry, though. Well, I think I think you begin to argue about uh, semantics on this. The, I think really the prime semantics. minister, well, the prime I mean... minister has said that he regrets it. He said that mistakes are made, but really the, the prime minister's focus is is actually and look what he's been doing over the weekend with uh, the the climate change summit, the huge progress we've made there. Uh, further announcements today on the the booster program. I think what people want now they they accept what we said, which is we made mistakes. They want this government actually to be focusing on the job at hand, and that's exactly what we're doing: tackling huge challenges like uh, global warming, securing the future for our children, our grandchildren, indeed our children's children, our grandchildren's grandchildren. These are the big long-term decisions that are being made by the government. And I can assure you, I see the prime minister pretty much every day, and certainly speak to him every day. That is where. His focus is. I understand that, minister. and you know we covered that extensively throughout the last two weeks here on Sky News. But um, the, the point is that the prime minister has not said sorry. You, for the first time, are the, the, the party six points behind Labour in the polls. That has not been seen while Keir Starmer has been in office, and that is the public giving you guys a bloody nose, saying, "Don't treat us like we're mugs because we are not." The least you can do is say sorry and say that you didn't mean to undermine the standard system, even if that's what you did. Well, the, the, the Prime Minister has said that we've made mistakes and that he, he regrets that. I think that, that's effectively uh, saying the same thing. We've accepted that we're going to pursue a different course. And actually, you'll see that from the, the motion that's before Parliament today, that we're accepting the, the standards recommendation. Indeed, Owen Paterson has uh, resigned as a Member of Parliament. But you talk about how the, the, the public feel about it. I really think, and this is my, my sense both from all the, the polls and from conversations that I, I have with people as, as party chairman, they want the government to be focused on getting on with the job. That is, they don't want the government to, to be distracted by other things. Or and be sleazy. Seen... They don't want them to be sleazy. Yes, of course. Um, and we all have to uphold the high standards in, in, in public life. But, but we have to demonstrate that we are delivering for people. That's what we're doing in delivering tackling climate change. We're delivering with billions of pounds extra for our NHS. We're delivering with improvements for the economy. That's what governments are elected to do. And certainly my focus and the government's focus is on getting on with that job. How's the new job going? Uh, I'm enjoying it enormously, thank you. <laughs> Lots of challenges, but I'm enjoying it enormously. <laughs> A round of uh, press interviews to go, so I better let you go. It's good to talk to you as nice always. Nice to talk to you. Thank too. you very okay, much indeed for joining us.